all of our votes coming up, be, you'll be seeing this come and go. So Senator Brasso is going to give his opening statement before mine. He's going to leave and vote, then I'll give mine, and we'll get started. We'll have you all have yours. So don't think that we're being disrespectful. We're just so sorry. Things to ha We have to go vote. So with that being said, Senator Brasso. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for holding today's very important hearing. You know, last week, this committee held a hearing on the supply of critical minerals. We discussed how President Biden's decision to cancel leases and delay permits for critical minerals is putting his own climate goals at risk. His decisions are also putting America's energy and national security at risk. Today, we're going to discuss the industries that are driving demand for critical minerals. When President Biden took office, he committed the United States to the Paris Climate Accord. When doing so, he announced sharp greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. To accomplish these goals, the President wants to increase by vast amounts the number of electric vehicles on the road and the number of wind turbines, batteries, and solar panels used to generate electricity. Whether you agree or disagree with the President's goals, there is no dispute that they will dramatically increase the demand for critical minerals. Last year, the International Energy Agency published a report on the future demand for critical minerals. It projects that by the year 2040, the demand for rare earth minerals will increase by 700 percent. The demand for nickel will increase by 1,900 percent. The demand for cobalt will increase by 2,100 percent. The demand for graphite will increase by 2,500 percent. And the demand for lithium will increase by 4,200 percent. When you look at where we are in terms of annual versus global demand from 2020 to 2040. The International Energy Agency isn't alone. The World Bank recently looked at future demand for copper. It found that to meet the world's demand for copper in the next 25 years, the world will have to mine the same amount of copper that has been mined in the last 5,000 years. Now, these are astonishing figures that neither President Biden nor those within his administration are willing to face head on. So where exactly would this growth in demand for critical minerals come from? Well, according to the International Energy Agency, most of it will come from manufacturers of solar and wind turbines, manufacturers of electric vehicle batteries and batteries to store wind and solar energy, and manufacturers of electric transmission and distribution components. Another important question to ask is, what does this growth in demand for these critical minerals mean for existing users of critical minerals? For example, today the defense sector, sector is a key source of mineral demand. According to the National Mining Association, the Department of Defense uses nearly 750,000 tons of minerals each year. These minerals are absolutely essential to our national security and the security of our allies. For that reason, I'm grateful that Scott Forney is here today, President of General Atomics, the Electromagnet Systems, for his willingness to testify. General Atomics has partnered with the Bear Lodge Rare Earth Mine Project located in northeast Wyoming. Once operational, the mine and processing plant will be an alternative to Chinese rare earths. For our national and our economic security, we cannot afford to rely on countries such as Russia and China for our mining, for our mineral mining, and for processing needs. Cutting China and Russia out of global mineral supply chains won't be easy. Russia's state-run nickel company produces nearly 20 percent of the world's high-grade battery quality nickel supply. China controls over 90 percent of the global rare earth element market, including refining and processing. It's clearly time for us to get serious about expanding domestic mineral production. So I look forward to discussing these topics with our witnesses today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. We're here today for part two of an important discussion on how to reverse our increasing vulnerability associated with a critical supply chain. Uh, we're going to put a put a uh, map up today to kind of show you what we're dealing with here. Uh, and it gives you uh, an idea of each, cha uh, each stage of the supply chain as we have uh, listed here. Last week's hearing highlighted the challenges we face in supplying our own critical minerals in domestic mining, processing, and refining. Today, we're going to shift our discussion to what is driving the need for these minerals in the first place and what kind of demand that we expect in the future. And I think some of the illustration and also some of the numbers you heard are quite astonishing. astonishing. Um, this discussion wouldn't be complete without hearing how we can leverage the recycling of these products and technologies at the end of the useful life to increase our domestic supply and offset some of the increasing demand. From, from the technologies needed to support military readiness 
and combat climate change to the cell phones in our pockets or the cars in our driveways, critical minerals are essential to life that we lead and the technologies we have come to depend on. Accelerating their production and establishing secure and dependable supply chains is vital to our energy and national security. That is why I was pleased to see President Biden take action last week to strengthen our critical mineral supply chain by invoking the Defense Production Act to address the minerals needed for advanced batteries. I'm also proud of the work that we did in this committee to include provisions in the bipartisan infrastructure law to build up our domestic manufacturing and recycling capabilities. While these actions are, critical, are a crucial step forward, more action is going to be necessary to get supply chains, including mining, processing, manufacturing, and more, where they need to be domestically to keep up with the growing demand for these critical minerals instead of increasing our reliance on China. Government support and intervention are necessary, but industry truly needs to be the leader in securing reliable and ethically sourced supplies for the materials that make up their products. I repeat the word ethically because we know where a lot of it's coming and in, in the pain and, and uh, the hardships on people. Every company involved in the downstream manufacturing of products that contain critical minerals has responsibility to know where their parts and materials are coming from. Companies must commit to building partnerships with domestic producers and material processors. And when they source overseas, transparency is a prerequisite. Manufacturing should be done with recycling in mind. And if there are barriers to that, I want to hear about them so we can get this right sooner than later. I'm pleased that we are joined today by several witnesses who will be able to shed some light on how the private sector is approaching all of these challenges. According to the International Energy Agency, stationary and electric vehicle batteries will account for about half of the mineral demand growth from clean energy technologies over the next 20 years. As the sector responsible for the largest portion of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, there is no question that we need to be doing all that we can to reduce emissions in the transportation sector. EVs certainly have a role to play in addressing those emissions. However, with China's dominance over the critical minerals required for the EVs, I have grave concerns about moving too quickly towards an EV-only future. When it comes to the EV battery supply chain, China is responsible for 80 percent of the world's battery material processing, 60 percent of the world's cathode production and 80 percent of the world's anode production and 73 percent of the world's lithium ion battery cell production. They have simply cornered the market. With numbers like these, it is frustrating to hear calls for a swifter transition to electrified transportation to reduce our dependence on foreign oil. We cannot replace one unreliable foreign supply chain with another and think it's going to solve our problems. That is why I also continue to advocate for parallel investment in hydrogen as a clean transportation fuel. Now I believe that domestic mining has to play a role in reducing our reliance on foreign supplies of raw materials, but is not the only tool that we have in our toolbox. Recycling provides a tremendous opportunity to avoid outsourcing and the raw supply of critical minerals that we need while creating new economic opportunities right here at home. So you want the recycling chart? This chart shows that recycling is a more efficient way to recover these materials in some cases. According to the Department of Energy, we can recover one ton of battery grade lithium from every uh, from only 28 tons of spent lithium ion batteries compared to 750 tons of brine for 250 tons of ore. And for cobalt, one ton of battery grade cobalt only needs five to 15 tons of spent batteries compared to 300 tons of ore. And all of this material can, be, uh, can feed right back into the processing, the capacity that we are developing here. I'm pleased that we are joined by Mr. Straubel uh, of Redwood Materials who can talk about the opportunities to grow this promising new industry. Uh, in the 1940s, in the wake of World War II and the Cold War started, kryptonite uh, made its first appearance in a Superman comic, a rare mineral found only on the fictional planet of Krypton. Kryptonite is the only thing that can render the seemingly invulnerable Man of Steel powerless. As tensions grew during, World War, uh, during the Cold War, our demand for critical minerals was now somewhere close to where it is today, but it turns out DC Comics was not, uh, they were onto something. The more we dive into this topic of critical minerals, the more I'm convinced that Superman isn't the only one who can be brought to his knees by rare minerals. If we, <laughs> they were getting creative on this one. 
If we don't address our dependence problem and look for innovative ways to onshore the supply chain, it will compromise our energy security and handicap us in local marketplaces. And we cannot let that happen. You all feel the same, I'm sure. I look forward to hearing from other witnesses, from all of our witnesses today, to understand how we can find a realistic path forward to continue utilizing the technologies we need without sacrificing our energy and national security. And now what I'm going to do is uh, turn to our panel of witnesses. We have with us Mr. David Howe, who's Director of Vehicle Technologies Office at the Department of Energy, as well as the Department's Acting Director of the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply. We have Mr. Duncan Wood. Uh, and Mr. Duncan Wood is Vice President for Strategy and New Initiatives at the Wilson Center. We have Mr. Scott Forney, uh, President of Electromagnetic Systems at General Atomics. We have Mr. Joe Britton, uh, who is Executive Director of the Zero Emissions Transportation Association. And we have Mr. J.B. Straubel, uh, uh, who is Founder and CEO of Redwood Materials. So before we turn to the witness for the opening remarks, I understand that Senator Cortez Masto would like to introduce one of our witnesses. Senator thank Cortez. you, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And thank you for your creativity, or at least your staff's. Um, thank you to the ranking member Barrasso as well for holding this important hearing today. It is my pleasure to be able to introduce J.B. Straubel, who is the founder and chief executive office, or, uh, excuse me, officer of Redwood Materials, a company that is headquartered in Carson City, Nevada, and focused on the recycling of lithium-ion batteries and reuse of lithium, cobalt, and other critical minerals in secondary applications. Mr. Straubel previously worked at Tesla for 15 years, where he served as the co-founder and chief technology officer. In that capacity, he led cell design, supply chain logistics, and the first gigafactory concept for the production ramp of Tesla's Model 3 vehicle. Throughout his career, JB has played an influential role in research and development, in team building and operational expansions from prototype cars to mass production and gigawatt scale projects. Uh, I am so excited he's here to talk about uh, what uh, incredible and innovative things they are doing with Redwood Materials. We are so pleased. He is in Nevada with his company, uh, and uh, I am uh, just grateful uh, Mr. Chairman, that we are having this important conversation today. Look forward to hearing from all the panelists as well. Welcome. We a, thank you, Senator. We have an outstanding panelist. We're, we're, if you all can indulge us, we're going to have to recess for about 10 minutes. I know that Senator Cortez Masto has to go vote. I've got to go vote. We're waiting for Sen Senator Brasso to come back to, to convene, and then we'll go through with your statements if you don't mind. So sorry.
Well, thanks so much for all your patience as we run back and forth, and we have a number of uh, votes that are happening today. But if it's all right with you, Mr. Howell, we'll start with your testimony and then work our way down the panel. Yes, sir. Thank you. Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to tes testify before you today. My name is Dave Howell, and I am the D Director of the Vehicle Technologies Office in the Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, as well as the Acting Director and Principal principal deputy director of the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains. In addition to these roles, I also serve as the chair of the Federal Consortium for Advanced Batteries. FCAB brings together 12 federal agencies that are collaborating to ensure a domestic supply of lithium batteries and are committed to accelerating the development of a robust and secure domestic industrial base. Climate change is one of the greatest challenges facing our nation and our planet today. DOE stands ready to work to address both the climate emergency and bolster our national and economic security through improving our domestic supply chain for critical minerals and materials needed to ensure that the U.S. builds a 100% clean energy economy and reaches net zero emissions no later than 2050. Critical materials are a key building block for a transition to a resilient net zero energy future and are also subject to supply risks. The department's critical materials strategy has three pillars diversification of supply, development of substitutes, and recycling and efficient use. The department's research, development, and demonstration portfolios, which include EERE's Critical Materials Institute, promote increasing American access to raw materials, lessening dependence on imports, and strengthening competitiveness of our domestic manufacturers at, of our domestic manufacturers at all stages of the supply chains for these critical materials. The Institute, led by Ames National Laboratory and a team of research partners, seeks to accelerate innovative scientific and technological solutions to develop resilient and secure supply chains for rare earth metals and other materials critical to the success of clean energy technologies. The DOE, along with the Departments of State and Defense, recently executed a memorandum of agreement that sets the foundation for a critical mineral stockpile process to support the U.S. transition to the clean energy and national security needs. The MOA formalizes an interagency partnership to acquire and recycle selected materials for technologies that range from grid-scale batteries to wind turbines. Additionally, on March 31st, President Biden signed a presidential determination expanding the Defense Production Act to include securing a reliable and sustainable supply of strategic and critical materials such as lithium, nickel, cobalt, graphite, and manganese for large-capacity batteries that are essential for the automotive and stationary storage sectors and to the national defense. The department will work closely with the Departments of Defense, Interior, Agriculture, and other agencies to plan and carry out activities necessary to build out a resilient and secure battery supply chain. Significant investments across the department are addressing critical minerals and materials challenges associated with the important supply chains, including for lithium ion batteries. ERE works to mitigate supply chain risks through fundamental and cross-cutting R&D and D just diversify supply, develop alternatives, and improve reuse and recycling. These supply chain risk mitigation strategies are directly aligned with the, with the federal strategy. The bipartisan infrastructure law includes more than $6 billion to fund domestic battery materials, processing, manufacturing, and recycling that will help improve grid resilience and scale up the electrification of cars, trucks, and buses. On February 11, 2022, DOE issued two notices of intent to provide $2.9 billion to produce to, to boost production of the advanced batteries and materials that are critical to the rapidly growing clean energy industries of the future, including electric vehicles and energy storage, as directed by the BIL. Both the newly established Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains Office and the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations offer new opportunities to support the development of a domestic lithium-ion battery supply chain. The Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations will oversee more than $20 billion in federal investments in clean energy projects. These projects will work towards the Biden administration's goal of reaching net zero emissions by mid-century by investing in demonstration projects to allow the U.S. to test possible clean energy solutions that can provide innovative and effective solutions to real world problems. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee today. I look forward to working with you as the U.S. transitions to a clean energy economy and reaches net zero emissions no later than 2050. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Howell, for your testimony. Dr. Wood. Thank you, Ranking Member Barrasso, um, and uh, greetings to the other uh, distinguished committee members and, of course, Chairman Manchin. 
Very grateful to be here today. My testimony focuses on the exponential demand that is expected for critical minerals in the next decades as a result of the move towards a global energy transition. My research and my remarks today point towards an urgent need for action from the US government in conjunction with allies and partners here in the US and abroad to find ways of satisfying that demand. I'd like to make two main points when addressing demand. The growth in demand for critical minerals is already impressive, but will become increasingly daunting as the energy transition advances. And secondly, policymakers and industry must work together to find an adequate response to this daunting reality with priority given to the development of new resources. The need to secure new lines of supply for the critical minerals essential for the energy transition is now firmly embedded in the mindset of policymakers. However, the urgency of the situation is still not fully understood by many. This urgency stems from two inescapable realities. First, we must recognize the scale of, of future demand for critical minerals, which in the case of several metals is shockingly large. Second comes the question of the pace of rising demand. Policymakers must embrace the painful truth that the highly worthy targets set for the energy transition can only be met by a combination of public policy incentives and massive investment now by the private sector here in the United States and abroad in new mining activities. According to recent publications by the World Bank and the International Energy Agency, uh, we see uh, that the, uh, the growth for uh, critical minerals is, uh, is truly exponential. Um, whilst there is strong demand growth for all minerals associated with, cl with clean energies, in the case of minerals such as cobalt, lithium, graphite, and indium, annual growth rates uh, reach stratospheric levels of several hundred percent. The IEA has identified in its uh, publication the role of critical minerals in clean energy transitions that whereas traditional hydrocarbons based energy generation systems are fuel intensive, renewable energy systems are material and specifically mineral intensive. To give one example, an onshore wind plant requires nine times more mineral resources than a gas fired power plant. The report goes on. Since 2010, the average amount of minerals needed for a new unit of power generation capacity has increased by 50% as the share of renewables has risen. Taking a closer look at lithium, an essential element in EV battery technology, it's estimated that by 2030, the global demand for lithium is expected to surpass 2 million metric tons of lithium carbonate equivalent, more than doubling the demand forecast for 2025. To put this in perspective, total global production of lithium today is only around 100,000 metric tons. The scale of the challenge must therefore not be underestimated. One way to grasp that scale has been put forward by Guillaume Pitron in The Rare Metals War, who notes that with a doubling of demand for rare earth elements every 15 years, at this rate over the next 30 years, we will need to mine more mineral ores than humans have extracted over the last 70,000 years. Sure. To address that demand, we need to have more than mere tinkering with the critical minerals policy in this country and globally. What is needed today is a whole of society approach that incorporates all levels of government, the private sector, research and educational institutions, and end, use, end users of critical minerals. This means adopting a holistic, open-minded approach to the issue, embracing the development of new resources, new forms of extraction and processing, new technologies, energy efficiency models, and recycling and waste reduction. Ignoring any one of these elements makes it impossible to build the new energy model and maintain it. On recycling, it is true, of course, that because minerals are a component of energy infrastructure and can be recovered and recycled, recycling will play an important role. However, there's a simple stark reality that must be addressed. Although recycling will play an increasingly important role, materials can only be recycled once they've entered the system. This means that as demand grows exponentially, it is logically and practically impossible for recycling to satisfy that demand until there are more raw materials in the system than current demand. This is a simple point, but one that must be stated and restated. The IEA has estimated that by 2040, recycled quantities of copper, lithium, nickel, and cobalt um, will, uh, from spent batteries could reduce combined primary supply requirements by around 10%. That's not insignificant, but it's vital to recognize that 90% of future demand growth must be satisfied by newly mined resources. To give an indication of the potential and limitations of future recycling for critical minerals, under current conditions, only around 35% of available copper is recycled today. To make matters worse, as the vehicle fleet is electrified, the minerals that are used to produce batteries will not be recycled for at least 10 years, as car owners get the maximum use out of their batteries. 
This time lag means that the full potential for EV battery recycling will only be realized a decade after massive electrification begins. It's vital to recognize once and for all the central and unavoidable role played by extraction in the clean, uh, sorry, critical minerals extraction in the clean energy transition. Mining is needed to power that transition in the same way that oil and gas powered the industrial transformation of the 20th century. If critical minerals stay in the ground, the transition will be insufficient. Urgent steps must be taken soon to address the severe deficit in critical minerals. To paraphrase an old adage, the best time to have done so would have been 10 years ago. The second best time is now. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Wood. Appreciate your testimony. Mr. Forney. Chairman Manchin. Ranking Member Brasso and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to the committee's exploration of significant global supply chain issues affecting critical minerals. My name is Scott Forney, and I am the president of General Atomics Electromagnetic Systems. General Atomics has a rich history of research development and technology innovation, which has led to an expanding, expanding portfolio of specialized products from undersea to space to weapons systems uh, and more and more for critical defense, industrial and commercial customers worldwide. I believe General Atomics brings an important perspective on the criticality of mineral demand to our national defense sector. I hope to draw your attention to the many challenges businesses like ours face within the defense industrial base as we uniquely supply, deal with the, the unique supply chain challenges. I'm here to highlight how complex and costly managing the demand for these critical minerals has become. We believe onshoring certain production capabilities and increasing the availability of critical minerals will help strengthen and protect U.S. industries and our military industrial base. Broader supply challenges have caused ripple effects for all Americans. Disruptions impact components for space systems, large structures for submarines or aircraft carriers or other ships, hypersonic weapon systems, laser weapon systems, fission reactors, and battery systems for the Department of Defense. We have experienced dramatic changes in the availability of critical materials since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic and we have become more cognizant of the strong reliance the defense industry has on foreign producers and our vulnerability to supply chain disruption. Given ongoing geopolitical challenges, disruption will continue to persist and more domestic capability, capability is not only an appropriate response, but a necessary one. Rather than making choices based on the engineering practices that we deem best engineering, Unavailability of special high-strength alloys has forced design decisions and changes to complex systems dependence on these materials. Volatility in the nickel market due to speculators and the Russian war in Ukraine have effectively shut down the market. Procurement efforts for submarine-grade materials containing nickel, including high-strength metals and nickel copper, were temporarily suspended. The future impact on nickel availability and price due to Russian sanctions is unknown. Lead times from some, for some of this critical material has increased from months to years. Many of our suppliers increasingly reserve the right to reprice their raw stock or forged materials after we place an order, referencing the volatility of material pricing and the availability due to market conditions. Planning for multi-year procurements, which drives our largest, most critical programs, while also maintaining reasonable margins of schedule and cost performance and cost risk to maintain contract profitability is getting more and more challenging every year. Members of the committee may be familiar with the increasing trend within the Department of Defense to award fixed price contracts versus cost plus contracts. These contracts do not account for the extreme type of market volatility we are experiencing today. The defense industrial base is paying the price for all of this out of pocket. President Biden's executive order of last February, American Supply Chain, ordered a review of vulnerabilities in our critical mineral and material supply chains, including rare earth elements. The Commerce Department initiated an investigation to determine effects on U.S. national security from imports of neodymium iron borne permanent magnets. Critical national security systems rely on neodymium iron borne magnets, including submarine propulsion motors and missile guidance systems, to say a few. To support the aims of both these executive orders 
and investigation, General Atomics is working with the Department of Energy for the design, construction, and operation of a rare earth element separation and processing demonstration plant near Upton, Wyoming. We have already extracted a thousand ton sample of Bear Lodge, Wyoming ore in anticipation of the demonstration facility startup. We expect to demonstrate a process to separate rare earth oxides into usable elements such as neodymium and for uh, praseodymium in less time, more efficiently, with greater purity and with less environmental impact than current extraction technologies worldwide. Since COVID-19, and now with the Russian-Ukraine conflict, rare earth element prices are triple or more of what they were before COVID-19. This is all challenging for all of us in the defense industrial base. Thank you again for your time and the opportunity to speak on this important subject. I look forward to your questions. Well, thanks so much, Mr. Forney. We're appreciative of your, uh, of your testimony. Mr. Britton. Chairman Manchin and Ranking Member Barrasso and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Joe Britton. I'm the executive director of the Zero Emission Transportation Association. We're a coalition of companies that represent the entire EV supply chain from battery and vehicle manufacturers to charging companies to critical mineral developers and utilities. I recognize that many here today may have already developed strong opinions about electric vehicles or the critical minerals needed to power them. So I intend to give you an honest assessment of the opportunities and the challenges to expanding EV adoption in the United States. Ultimately, I believe that EVs will be an American success story, leading to not only emissions reduction, but a rejuvenated manufacturing base where everyone is better off, even those who may never get behind the wheel of an EV. If we get this right, there will be more Americans who benefit from a stable career, who avoid breathing polluted air, or whose small business benefits from a new manufacturing plant opening in their hometown. Private industry is investing tens of billions of dollars in new EV manufacturing along a corridor from the industrial Midwest to states like Arizona and Oklahoma, Georgia and Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee, the Carolinas, and most recently announcements we've seen from Green Power Bus and Sparks Batteries creating 1,200 jobs in West Virginia. These investments are aimed at helping meet American demand for electric vehicles, which is important because a bipartisan supermajority, 71% of Americans are considering an EV for their next purchase. If we don't rise to the challenge, these consumers may turn to foreign imports as they did in the early 2000s. Ensuring that American companies have the support and incentives to meet this demand will require a comprehensive, bipartisan strategy to drive both vehicle manufacturing and a durable North American supply chain for critical minerals. These minerals are essential not just for EVs, but traditional gas-powered vehicles, satellites, missile systems, oil and gas production, and all consumer electronics, including iPhones and laptops. Limited production and refining capacity is especially challenging, though, since nearly all extraction ends up in Asia for processing. But that doesn't need to be the case. And it certainly doesn't mean American workers should be counted out. In fact, North America has greater mineral resources than China, and we can outcompete along with our allies, those that stand in our way. Zeta represents a host of companies seeking to expand our domestic critical mineral production and processing, as well as battery manufacturing. Companies like Albemarle, Ioneer, and Lithium Americas are scaling up lithium production. When their operations are up and running, they could produce enough lithium to manufacture nearly 4 million EVs a year, representing 25% of new car sales. Gervois will begin producing enough cobalt in Idaho to meet 15 to 20% of today's annual U.S. cobalt demand with capacity to grow. They're also expanding, importantly, the processing in Brazil and Finland to wrestle away refining capacity from China and securing a reliable source for our manufacturing base. Novonics, operating in Tennessee, will support 150,000 metric tons of synthetic graphite production by 2030. This will help power 3 million EVs a year. Redwood Materials, joined today, I won't steal your thunder, um, but is, is planning to be able to support, supply a, um, enough materials for a million EVs in the next few years, 5 million by the year 2030. U.S. manufacturers like Tesla, Lucid, Rivian, Proterra, and Arrival, and battery manufacturers like Panasonic are seeking to build their cell production work here, which will further drive domestic critical mineral production and processing capacity. The Defense Production Act that the President invoked, which has already been mentioned, uh, was done at the request of both Republicans and Democrats on this committee and demonstrated the administration's intent to expand our capabilities and signal to the entire federal government a commitment to securing these supply chains. This is important to get right for not only economic reasons, but to secure a stable supply chain that meets our values. 
but it's also important to limit the unnecessary carbon emissions of shipping hev heavy metals around the globe for processing only to return and be integrated into American batteries. I recognize that at times we can talk past each other. Some may say permitting reform, some may say refining re mining reform. What I think many of us can agree on though is that the permitting process should protect our communities but also fairly adhere to a predictable schedule to reflect the urgency of securing these critical minerals. Chairman Manchin and Senator Murkowski's critical materials bill, which Zeta endorsed and everybody that voted for the bipartisan infrastructure bill supported, serves as an example of the direction in which Congress should be heading to streamline this process. Today's supply chain is complicated and it has many challenges, but turning away in the face of these obstacles only means conceding to foreign commercial interests. We know how to fight these battles and we've won them before. American companies are working hard to onshore their supply chains, but they need federal support through predictable permitting, battery, vehicle, and charging tax incentives, and a whole of government approach to drive transportation electrification. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Burton, for your testimony. And now, Mr. Strobel. Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm J.B. Strobel. I'm the founder and chief executive officer at Redwood Materials. Prior to starting Redwood, <clears throat> I co-founded and was CTO at Tesla for 15 years. At Tesla, I led battery cell design and built and scaled the first gigafactory and also launched and ran our stationary energy storage business. It was during this time at Tesla that I had a front row seat to the challenges and opportunities that the industry as a whole will face as vehicle and energy markets electrify. It became clear that the supply chain around batteries could gate the entire speed of our energy transition. I started Redwood Materials to develop a fully closed loop domestic su supply chain for lithium ion batteries. From consumer devices, electric vehicles, and energy storage systems, refining the materials and then remanufacturing them back into usable components for battery manufacturers, both anode and cathode. These can go directly to cell manufacturers like Ford, Panasonic, and many others. This committee has shown tremendous foresight in recognizing the urgent risk to our nation's security and energy independence due to shortages of critical materials. We saw evidence of this leadership just last week when, the, when President Biden announced that he would be enacting the Defense Production Act to address this issue. Equally important are the downstream components that these minerals build. Today, the two most critical and expensive components in lithium ion batteries, the anode and the cathode, are produced via supply chain almost entirely based in Asia, as we've heard from others. Our current supply chain would require that metals, whether newly mined or recycled, travel outside the United States where this component manufacturing infrastructure exists. This is because there is a gap in the US between critical mineral extraction and domestic battery cell manufacturing. Redwood is working to close this gap by domestically producing large scale sources of these anode and cathode materials produced from as many recycled batteries as are available, augmented, as has also been noted, with sustainably mined materials in order to uh, supply this transition. On a personal note, I flew here directly today from Korea, where I spent the last few days actually visiting some of the world's leading cathode manufacturing factories uh, in Korea, some of them who we're partnering with directly to move te technology and process to the United States. It's a sobering and uh, humbling experience seeing the scale and investment and speed that's happening uh, in these Asian countries and what we need to reproduce here. The United States today only accounts for about 10% of global battery cell production. 65% of the cost uh, that goes into those cells is imported, mainly from Asia. This overall industry is projected to scale by more than 500% in just the coming decade and continue scaling beyond that. At Redwood, we aim to manufacture 100 gigawatt hours of, per year of both anode and cathode materials by 2025 enough to domestically produce more than 1 million electric vehicles per year. By 2030, we aim to produce 500 gigawatt hours per year of these battery materials, or enough to supply over 5 million electric vehicles. As a nation overall, our increased battery demand presents an opportunity. Not only does an investment in producing battery components help capture, otherwise, uh, capture greater than $100 billion of economic value from now until 2030, that would otherwise be lost you know, to battery materials manufacturing abroad. But additionally, as an increasing number of batteries reach end of life every year, our country has a growing and very sizable, infinitely recyclable resource at our disposal right here. 
Today, Redwood is receiving already about six gigawatt hours per year of end-of-life batteries annually. This is about 60,000 electric vehicles equivalent worth of material uh, that we recycle and recover more than 95% of the metals like nickel, cobalt, lithium, and copper as noted uh, in critical demand. We then use these critical materials to remanufacture anode and cathode components domestically and supply these back to the battery cell manufacturers without those materials ever leaving the country. This is our goal. Panasonic, who is co-located uh, at the Tesla Gigafactory, number one in Nevada, will be the first cell manufacturer to source Redwood's anode copper foil, making the first time batteries will be recycled, remanufactured, and returned to the same factory in a fully closed loop, again, without ever leaving the country. The transition to electric transportation and clean energy is coming, creating a domestic circular supply chain for batteries in the US is a win-win, allowing our country to create significant economic gains and security, tens of thousands of jobs, decreasing our risk and reliance on foreign manufacturing, and ensuring that more than $100 billion will be used and invested in these American enterprises versus going overseas. I want to thank the committee for holding this important hearing and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you. And so sorry for us going back and forth. We still have two more votes to go, so we'll be all moving in and out a little bit, if you don't mind. We're going to start with our questions right now. Um, in my opening remarks, I made a reference to Superman. And uh, sticking with the theme of Marvel Comics, Spider-Man gave us the iconic line, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, so, Mr. Forney and, and to uh, Mr. Britton, uh, what concrete steps are your companies taking to learn more uh, to really learn more about where your mineral supplies are coming from and uh, will your company or member companies commit to responsible sourcing. That's all that we need to know if you can comment on that. Uh, thank you, Chairman Manchin, for the question. Uh, General Atomics uh, spends a great deal of time on supply chain uh, challenges. Uh, there are requirements, though, imposed on us on our contracts from the Department of Defense that requires much of our sourcing to be done domestically, uh, and that challenges us because there's so many products that we need uh, from the international supply chain. In addition to that, there are things called a DFARS, which is Defense Federal uh, Acquisition Regulation Supplement that has clauses uh, that require us to use specialty materials from U.S.-based domestic supply or from very specific countries. As a result of that, uh, we have uh, an extensive process uh, called uh, approved supply list that we process our different um, supply, suppliers around the country and around the world to provide those materials. We also try to stockpile as much as we can. So um, unusual probably in our business, we'll spend a fair amount of company internal money to make sure that when we know we have long lead challenges, uh, that we'll get that material in-house for future contracts that maybe take several years. As an example, uh, as COVID-19 uh, hit us in March of 2020, uh, just my business within General Atomics, we had 25 million piece parts in our Tupelo, Mississippi manufacturing facility. So we didn't hit uh, a supply chain challenge for that first year of the pandemic as a result of that. But this is a big challenge, which is why we're uh, devoting 50% uh, cost share against this Department of Energy uh, separation uh, facility uh, in Upton, Wyoming, so we can get to the rare earth elements ourselves. Mr. Britton. We're also producing domestically. Um, we've got um, companies like Ioneer. I think they're going to be probably the cleanest lithium production in the world. They're also going to be, do, uh, be doing processing which is crucial. So, you know, right now, one of the deficits in the critical mineral space is that no matter where those minerals are extracted, much of that goes to China for processing. And so the more that we reshore processing, the more we can sustainably uh, provide manufacturers here a base for their critical mineral needs. Um, others like Lithium Americas, they're, um, they're coming online. Uh, Albemarle has Silver Peak, which is producing lithium. They're exploring um, in, uh, in King Mountain in the Carolinas. We also have Piedmont Lithium and Liv Livent Lithium. Uh, Gervois is really close to coming online with a cobalt manufacturing in Idaho. Um, so together, we, we see a pathway where we can domestically source all these key critical minerals for millions and millions of EVs a year in just a few years. Let me, let me, let me ask this. I'm, Mr. Obama, I'm going to go to you first, okay, on that, and then I'll go Mr. Howell, Mr. Wood. Uh, the way I see things playing out right here, you know, you see the administration's determination basically with a piece of legislation they've put out, if we would go down that path about wanting, what, by 2035, uh, almost an entire uh, transportation fleet EVs if they could. 
uh, I'm concerned about putting our uh, transportation mode uh, in the whole uh, hands of uh, foreign supply chains. So, okay, now they're going to give, they want to give $2,500 uh, credit to anybody that buys a car that has a battery that was made in America. Made in America and all of the resources that and go into that battery is a different story. So I would not be for that unless the whole thing is sourcing. That means the environmental community has got to get on board and quit putting all the restrictions that we go. Every time you want to go to a mine or processing, you go to court. So give me a time element, an, 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 an estimate of a time element that we could be totally self-sufficient from the resources sourcing and basically uh, doing all the uh, refinery and everything cathodes, anodes, everything it takes to make a battery unless there's a new source of a battery that's going to be made or a new style of battery. Mr. Straubel. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's, um, it, it depends a little bit how fast we're able to invest in those industries. You know, as we've noted, we don't have many of those critical manufacturing industries today. Uh, they exist entirely in Asia. You know, about 65% of the, the cost structure of What's the reason for that? Somewhat legacy. This is where those industries grew. Uh, it's where they originated as part of the consumer electronics industry. You know, maybe 15 to 20 years ago, and you know, Asia viewed these industries very strategically and invested strategically as part of long-term plans. So, so that has continued, and they've really, as you've noted, dominated this whole industry. And so, for us to get up to speed, just give me an idea. One year, three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years? I think it's certainly closer to a five to 10 year window before we could you know, recover. Totally be self-sufficient. And, and build enough of these industries to have that entire supply chain uh, sourcing. Don't tell me the average time of, of a permit just to get a mining permit to take the product out of the grounds 10, 10 years. That's just, a, that's just a permit to mine. That's, that's not to do any of the processing. Just a mining permit. Anybody have any, <laughs> Mr. Walker? It's very quick, I know I'm over time here, but. This is, it's interesting. What do you have? Uh, thank you for your question, Senator, and your leadership in this in this space. It's very important for the Department of Commer uh, Energy as well. Um, our effort is to develop a circular economy for electric vehicles and electric vehicle batteries by the 2040-2050 time frame, including um, significant recycling uh, for advanced batteries. Uh, and um, so, why would we give a $2,500 credit? for th something that we don't do, and we have to rely on China to do it, why are we giving the credit for that? We do have uh, capabilities in the lithium space today, uh, a lot of resources and reserves. Um, cobalt and nickel, uh, we're trying to reduce the amount of cobalt needed in these batteries. You're changing co composition I'm of the sorry. battery itself. Yeah, absolutely. I got you. Yeah. Mr. Wood, you want to say anything real quick? Just very, very quickly, I think that the, uh, the targets are, are laudable, but I, I'm not sure if they're realistic. Um, for a number of reasons, um, consumer preferences, um, but most importantly, I would say that there is a, we're, we're heading towards a cliff edge here. And uh, folks uh, such as the, the team at TechMet, um, you know, a London-based firm, who have looked at this just say, it's, it's almost impossible to get there, not just in terms of the United States providing those, but uh, globally. When you look at just the amount of materials that are going to be needed to reach 50% of the vehicle fleet being electric in the next decade or so, there just aren't enough being produced globally. So we have to think, we, we either have to make a, a gargantuan or her Herculean uh, task right now of getting them out of the ground here and around the world, or we say we have to push that target back a bit. I'm sorry. Uh, my go, ahead. Keep, go ahead if you want to. Go ahead. I'm so sorry. You You're good. No, I was I was going to just mention while you were out. We 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 agree on your critical minerals uh, streamlining and permitting um, bill. I think there's two reasons to move quickly. One is, and, and you'd asked JB about this. Why aren't we doing the processing here? The processing um, with inv investments that are happening in Asia, we didn't make here because there wasn't a critical mass of battery cell production. And so there's a through line where if we are creating these products here, we're building these battery cells and building these vehicles, it then has follow-on impacts where we're justifying additional investment and processing, which further secures a North American supply chain. The other thing that's really, really important is every battery that we have, and this is a reason to move quickly, becomes, in, when, time, when gas prices are high, there's a lot of discussion about the National Petroleum Reserve. 
Every vehicle that we bring to America or that we make here and manufacture becomes part of a national strategic battery reserve. Those critical minerals, if they are here in a product, whether that's in your hand or your driveway, become JB's feedstock to, to sustainably source critical minerals for decades to come. Senator Brasso. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I see the second vote has started. And, uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Forney. Um, in your testimony, you note that uh, General Atomics has partnered with the Bear Lodge Rare Earth uh, Pro Element Project in, in Northeast Wyoming. Uh, what's unique about the Rare Earth Element deposits in this area, my home state, and, and why are you backing the project? Ranking Member Brasso, thank you for the question. Um, it is very important for General Atomics as a developer and producer of advanced defense products that rely very much on rare earths for components. We, we rely on uh, uh, rare earths for our laser weapons, for our hypersonic systems. We have increasingly relied on high power permanent <coughs> magnets uh, and for space components, et cetera. We and our allies must improve our ability to uh, control rare earths in the supply chain. If you go back to 1965, 85% of the rare earth elements were provided from the United States. You know, look what's happened uh, to where we are today. Certainly, when we look at Bear Lodge and 18 million tons of, uh, of uh, clean and high-grade rare earth materials, that's of great interest to, to the company. Uh, in addition, um, there is a critical missing link, and the missing link is the ability to separate the mixed rare earths that occur in nature into individual elements because of permanent magnets, for example, require uh, rare earths such as neodymium, et cetera. Unless these elements uh, or suitable combinations of them can be separated, magnets cannot be made. Indeed, the strategic value of the Bear Lodge deposit can only be achieved if separation is available. That is why our team and the Department of Energy are cost-sharing this important construction of a facility in Upton, Wyoming, that will demonstrate economic separation from Bear Lodge ore of rare earths critical to permanent uh, magnet manufacture. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Dr. Wood. In your testimony, you said a couple of things. You said the United States and most of the rest of the world find themselves spectacularly ill-prepared to meet the challenge of the rising demand for critical minerals, and you call for a combination of public policy incentives and massive investment now by the private sector uh, here in the United States and abroad in new mining activities. Uh, you note that permitting remains a major concern in the United States. Why is it so important for Congress to fix the permitting process? Thank you, Ranking Member Barasa, for that. Um, yeah, in the research that we've done at the Wilson Center, um, in conjunction, in collaboration with uh, private sector, universities, and government, uh, the permitting uh, lag here in the United States is seen as being one of the most important uh, impediments to getting minerals out of the ground and to market. We need to reduce the time needed to open a mine, and we need to get that, those minerals out of the ground as quickly as possible to processing plants and obviously to the industry and end users that, uh, that utilize them. And I think the, uh, the best comparison that we can make is obviously with countries like Australia and Canada, which have uh, an averaging permitting time of two years compared to the seven to 10 years taken here in the United States. Um, they do not have lower standards than the United States. I think all of us agree that we need to protect the environment, um, but uh, they found a way to do it. Now, part of that is because they have different political systems. Part of that is because the states or provinces play a less important role in this than uh, their counterparts do here in the United States. Part of it is that the United States has a much more litigious culture than other countries, and that causes uh, problems. But I think that addressing this while still respecting standards has to be one of the priorities if we are actually going to move on this. And one other thing I will say there, uh, Senator Barrasso, if I may, which is um, the, uh, the discussions that have been going on recently in the International Seabed Authority, uh, where the United States is conspicuous by its absence in the, in the conversation, I think shows us what is possible um, in the rest of the world and where the United States really needs to take a good look and say, we need to be part of these conversations. There are enormous amounts of minerals on the seabed. There are huge uh, environmental implications there. But it's going to happen anyway, and the United States should be part of that conversation. Uh, Mr. Mr. Forney, my final question. Uh, you know, General Atomics is a manufacturer of defense systems for the U.S. military. 
Uh, it competes with companies which use critical minerals for commercial purposes, not defense purposes. In your testimony, you say competition with commercial industry has made procurement of high-quality lithium-ion battery cells extremely difficult. You go on to state decisions are being made based on availability instead of optimum technical solutions. Uh, when you refer to commercial industry, do you mean electric vehicle manufacturers? And, and what kind of compromises has General Atomics had to make in light of competition from a commercial industry? The question um, is an interesting one to us because today we're, we, General Atomics, are integrating thousands and thousands of lithium-ion batteries for Department of Defense undersea applications, uh, and of course the source for those batteries comes from Asia. Uh, secondly, we are trying to f finalize qualifying batteries for our airborne assets. And unfortunately, because of the significant demand for lithium-ion batteries in the electric vehicle market and others, uh, the batteries that we had uh, qualified are no longer available, and we had to find another source of manufacture, uh, which for us was in North America, uh, but it's not at the same cost value. And that challenges us, uh, like other products, when we have to make these kind of decisions due to inavailability of product. Uh, thanks, Mr. Forney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, I, I just have to thank you again for, for holding these important hearings, uh, and thank you to the ranking member as well. I think today's hearing further exemplifies the uh, sentiment, really, that I expressed at last week's hearing, that Nevada is a nexus for our clean energy and critical mineral future. Nevada is the only state in the country that encompasses every facet of the lithium-ion battery economy from the mining uh, of lithium deposits to the research and development to production, assembly, and finally to recycling. Here's the deal. This is our moonshot, and this is why this is such an important issue. It, it is important for the administration to stake a goal for all of us to marshal our resources. Whether we achieve that goal can always be in question, but at least we are moving in the same direction, just like Kennedy did when he made his announcement that he was gonna put a man on the moon, this is our moment to focus on a clean energy economy, taking the technology, taking the opportunities and the minerals that we have here to build out that clean energy economy and make it right here in America. We are the innovators, we are the entrepreneurs, we are the ones that can do it. Now we can sit here and armchair quarterback everything about it, but at the end of the day, without an administration and a focus of all of us moving in that direction, we will never get there, and we will be out. Literally, countries will outcompete us. They already are. We know it. We're talking about it right now. And so to me, this is a moment for all of us to marshal behind this and figure out how we get it done. It's our future. It's the future for our kids. It's the future for our planet. And we should be leading this. We should be competitive internationally. And this is our moment to do it. So I just can't stress that enough because there are going to be things that we should be doing in Congress to incentivize, to incentivize us continuing to move in that direction. And I, I'm going to talk a couple of, uh, about them because right now I'm working with Senator Bennett and other finance members to introduce a bill to establish an advanced battery manufacturing investment tax credit for building new plants or retrofitting existing manufacturing plants that make high capacity batteries. I am also working with Congressman Eric Swalwell to introduce the Rare Earth Magnet Production Tax Credit Act. This bill supports the domestic production for rare earth mineral magnets used in the automotive and renewable energy industries, including in the motors of over 90% of electric vehicles. There are things that we can do working together as long as we are focused in that ultimate goal at the end of the day, uh, we can make this happen. Whether we achieve the specific goal, at least we're moving in that direction. That's what this is about to me, and that's why it is so important we are all here today having this conversation. So let me start with Mr. Strabo on the recycling. Can, can you tell us about the current state of recycling and reuse for critical minerals? Are the technologies we need to do this available and ready to be deployed, and how much material can we harvest this way compared to original sourcing? Yeah, thank you for your question. 
the technology to do the recycling and refining is, is quite mature today. As I noted in my opening remarks, uh, we're already doing this at about six gigawatt hours per year, more than 60,000 know, vehicles per year equivalent uh, of materials. Uh, what's not yet very mature and doesn't exist is the remanufacturing. So once we recycle and partially refine those materials, we need to build the industries in North America to keep the materials here and bring them all the way back into cell manufacture again. Um, you know, in terms of percentages and how much you know, can we actually supply, um, I do agree with you know, some of Dr. Wood's comments earlier that you know, recycling can't meet 100% of the need. It, it's you know, logically not possible when we're growing the whole industry. However, with regard to some particular elements like cobalt, you know, we are able to get much closer to 100% of the need because of the shifting technology in batteries. Today's batteries that go into an EV or, or many other advanced applications use much less cobalt than a generation ago. So when we recycle and harvest old batteries, we can actually recover far more cobalt and spread that into a much, much larger you know, production fleet. So it's different based on element. Uh, nickel and lithium you know, will need a lot of new demand, and we will have to find ways to sustainably source new mined material, whether it's from the United States directly or from neighboring countries or, uh, or, or different regions that are doing this responsibly. Um, recycling can, we believe, meet maybe 25 to 30 percent of the, the goals that we plan to do over the next uh, five to 10 years. Thank you. And, and then, Mr. Wood, let me ask you, is uh, the goal here for Congress is to continue to incentivize to move in that direction, right? And, and we're all going to come up with ideas uh, that uh, obviously are important for not just our states, but for our country and to, to position us competitively so that we can bring that full supply chain back. We're building here uh, from the extraction all the way to the processing and mining and getting all of the products made here and components in America. Is there anything for purposes of Congress, is there anything we've done so far or that we're proposing that is going to hinder it? In other words, uh, if we are talking about investment tax credits to incentivize an industry to continue to move in that direction, are there any that we've proposed right now are, are going to hinder that or chill that somehow? Thank you, Senator. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I'm qualified to talk about the impact of tax credits, um, honestly. But what I will say is this. I worry a great deal that when either Congress or the administration moves, um, such as we saw with the DPA announcement, um, that all of a sudden people say, okay, so we've done something, now we can back off. I think that we have to keep, as you said very eloquently, you know, it's a moonshot. We have to keep our eyes on the prize, which is to say that this is not something that we're gonna resolve, a one and done solution. What we have to do is we have to keep moving forward. And uh, I really appreciate JB's comments just now which is that it's not an either or, it's an all of the above. The fact is we need recycling, the fact is we need new resources, the fact is we need tax credits, we need massive investment in human capital for this. We need to think not just about the United States, but we need to think about our partners and allies internationally where we can have secure supply chains, ally shoring if you will. We exist in the region of North America, which I think we have to recognize to the north of us is a massive mineral deposit in Canada. To the south of us is a country which has impressive mineral resources, perhaps not the easiest country to work with at this point in time, but we need to think about how we pull it all together in an integrated and holistic way. That's, I think, is, is the danger here, is that if we, take, if we take our eyes off the prize because we've done something, then we miss ultimately the uh, achieving that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, Mr. Wood, I think you just called Canada a massive mineral deposit. Uh, so anyway, uh, listen, in, um, 19, in the 1980s, there was a plant built at the Gramercy Refinery in Louisiana to extract gallium from Gramercy's aluminum plants process stream, completed. Within days of starting up, the then-dominant market player paid the operator not to start up, and they dismantled the plant. At around 2012, the same refinery was about to enter into a JV with the world's largest virgin gallium plant. Uh, the Chinese knew about this, flooded the market. The, the, the partner was also creating a rare earth mining operation in Colorado. It went into Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection because of these predatory practices by the Chinese. So now a group is looking to use the refinery to extract bauxite and other minerals from the collected waste. 
So in your testimony, you spoke of how the U.S. is ill-prepared for the growing demand. I guess my question is, um, there is clearly a risk of dominant players flooding the market to destroy the, just as I just described, the uh, ability of someone to make men's meet as they produce these. Uh, how do we protect against these practices as we attempt to scale critical mineral development and refining? Uh, thank you. It's an excellent question, Senator Cassidy. Um, and the fact is, it comes back to a question that was raised earlier on. How is it that the Chinese have got so far ahead of us? How is it that Asia is so far ahead of us? It's because they took the long-term view many years ago. They saw this as a strategic opportunity, and they continue to act because this is a geopolitical and geoeconomic competition. But I would argue it's not just long-term view. It's also a predatory view. Absolutely. And so it's about their current geopolitical and geoeconomic goals as well. And I'll give you another example. No, but tell me, because I have limited time. How do we cut... How do we address this? So if they're going to do something in Gramercy, Louisiana, uh, the Chinese don't flood the market and cut out the knees of, uh, of their ability to return a profit. Uh, we, have to, uh, we have to recognize that there are more factors that need to come into the equation than just price. We need to recognize that, that the value of critical minerals here is of strategic So are you and suggesting interest. a greater financial role to create for, uh, for, by the federal government, for example, to create a critical uh, reservoir of such supplies uh, at a guaranteed price that would be above their cost of production? Strategic reservoirs are one option, um, uh, providing uh, uh, incentives to purchase uh, U.S. Uh, by American is another way to go about it, and recognizing that you have to keep uh, certain foreign interests out of uh, strategically important industries here in the United States is another way of going about it. We do it with ports and airports. Let me ask, Mr. Forno, you just spoke about how your cost of acquiring a product, I'm sorry I was, uh, didn't listen entirely to what you just said, but because you had to source to another provider, it increased your cost. How practical is it for the federal government to put in a Buy American clause that would require your company to purchase uh, a higher cost product mainly because the Chinese would be flooding the market, um, but something that would be the long-term stabilize the market. So Senator Cassidy, thanks for the question. Uh, first of all, the, the federal government does that to the Department of Defense already with the um, DFAR supplement that I talked about earlier, requiring specialty metals to be purchased domestically for the most part. There are metals that we're allowed to buy elsewhere, but we, we do that already. And for many of our programs, we already have domestic uh, supply requirements. General Atomics is very vertically integrated. We probably produce and assemble, manufacture 75 to 85 percent of anything we provide to the federal government. But uh, getting those piece parts, that's where the challenge is. And yes, I think we can uh, handle the domestic requirement to buy America. Sounds great. Mr. Wood, back to you. Uh, I'm going to do a little plot product placement here. I recently uh, put out something called Resetting America's Energy and Climate Policy. Um, and in it, um, we talk about uh, extensive permitting and siting reform in order to accomplish many of our goals. I will point out right now that if we enforce our environmental and labor um, rules and enforce them upon other treaty partners, it is a race to the bottom in which China, by not enforcing, lowers their cost of production and therefore gains market share. Uh, again, we have to reverse that race to the bottom and get a race to the top. So uh, what would you think about some sort of carbon border carbon adjustment that would say, okay, if your emissions are above a certain standard overseas, above that which we would allow here in the United States, that there would be some fee placed upon your import in order to hopefully elevate their standard of production, lower their emissions, and by so doing, frankly, support our mining activity for critical minerals as opposed to those who pay no attention whatsoever to environmental considerations in their mining activity. Thoughts? Uh, it, it, it's an interesting idea. What I do fear in that case is that we're going to see um, uh, uh, interruptions of the supply chain, further interruptions of the supply chain, um, further inflationary pressures coming in because of that. Uh, another way to go about it is to actually engage in the um, uh, global ESG conversation in a more meaningful, uh, meaningful way. Um, we already have the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. Um, of course, we have uh, our own initiatives here in the United States. It needs to be pulled together. And those but the only problem with that, if I may say, if you've got a dominant player in providing cobalt, you can do ESG as much as you want, but if they got all the cobalt, you got to buy from them. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important to, to, to look at the new technologies and the new ways of reducing 
uh, cobalt use. We don't have a substitute for it at this point in time. Manganese offers us uh, some kind of, uh, of hope for the future, but uh, we, are, uh, we still need that. You're absolutely right. So uh, ultimately, we need to have a more strategic vision outside of the country as well. We need to be there in, in a lot of these countries to gain access to those materials in a way that the Chinese have done over the last 20 years. I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. We have Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for all your work you've been doing on this uh, critical, essential task. Um, let me start with uh, Mr. Britton. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the oil shocks of the 1970s. Uh, I remember standing in line for, to buy gas. Uh, give us some of the fundamental differences between oil and critical minerals, and the, how do these differences impact the vulnerability that we deal with today? And then second, speak to the importance of critical minerals uh, as to EVs, as you, ha you have somewhat, uh, but can you speak to some of the steps policymakers can take to, to ensure that we have a robust EV industry secure against external shocks? Well, I appreciate the question. So I'll, I'll compare um, oil and electricity on two fronts. Uh, one is cost uh, and the other is resilience. So on cost, um, the, the, the Zeta um, um, team and, and network did a comparison between the AAA gas prices in a number of states, uh, including Colorado, compared that to the Energy Information Administration cost of electricity. And it turns out that in many states, it is four to six times more costly to propel your vehicle with gasoline. Uh, so that's not 20% or 30% more, that is 500 to 600% more. Um, so there's enormous savings that can be uh, generated and, and, and really help uh, families um, afford to, you know, whether that's go to school or church, uh, go about their daily lives. The other is the resiliency. And I think this is something, and, and, and the chairman asked a question about this earlier. Um, I think the most important thing, and this is, I'm, I'm glad that JB and I are both here together, is that when we import a, a barrel of oil and it gets burnt, that is, it is gone forever, except for the lingering impacts from climate change and public health. Um, the nice thing about um, critical minerals is that they're recyclable. We can get 95% of the critical minerals back out of a battery. Um, and that's really important. And we actually, you know, and there's a, there's a relationship there because we actually have a refining deficit of both crude oil and critical minerals. The reason that we import 8 million barrels of oil a day is that our refineries are designed for heavy imported crude from Russia and Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. We similarly have a deficit of um, critical mineral processing, which requires imports. So there's a similarity there. And the thing that we need to do to address that, and I think part of it is the, the chairman and Senator Murkowski's critical mineral bill that was included in the Bipartisan in Infrastructure Act, but also there's important investments that we made in that same law for processing, um, for recycling. Um, we're on the right track, but what we need more than anything is to drive a strong EV sector because, like we've alluded to, the more we have um, domestic manufacturing, the more that becomes an attraction. It's a pull force where we can then have more of the critical mineral, not only development, but processing and have a true secure supply chain that doesn't benefit just EVs, but every other consumer product that requires these minerals. Got it. I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm going to switch over to uh, Mr. Howell. Um, but maybe Mr. Straubel and Mr. Uh, Britton can both chime in, uh, although I'm almost out of time. I've got a couple of minutes, but concision always matters. Uh, as, we work up to, as we work to scale up uh, domestic critical mineral supply chains, obviously we have to make the most of what we have. Um, things like batteries can be multi-purpose. Um, so we're working on legislation in collaboration with the Vehicle Technologies Office uh, that will encourage vehicle to grid uh, integration, which, you know, utilizes uh, vehicle batteries for transportation storage and mobile power. Uh, how can your office and the Department of Energy encourage efficient, effective, and multi-purpose use of our existing critical minerals? And then Mr. Straubel, Mr. Britton, when he finishes, just briefly chime in on are there other things we should be worried about when you, when you use batteries for more than just the, the vehicle it was intended for? Uh, thank you, Senator uh, Hickenlooper, for your question, and certainly a priority area is to get the most out of any battery that we manufacture in the United States, including vehicle-to-grid, and we call it vehicle-to-X. It could be vehicle-to-home, vehicle-to-building. Yep. And so we are working with uh, our partners in industry and uh, utility partners to develop concepts and analyze 
the uh, most profitable way to use um, not only um, electric vehicle batteries in the car, but second use of those batteries as well. And so we have a re battery recycling prize uh, to award um, profitable business models in order to show how we can not only recover lithium batteries, but also uh, uh, profitably use them in a second use, and if not in a second use, to get them to a recycling center. Right. And I generally don't say profitably in this context. <laughs> I say efficiently. But it's the same thing. Anyway, real quickly. Yeah, just very quickly. I think the, it's an excellent application and should be done. I think it will be done using batteries on the grid in homes. We have to keep a slight eye on making sure the lifetime is managed accordingly, but I, I'm optimistic that can be done as long as it's designed accordingly for the extra cycles, extra use. Right. Um, maybe just one really quick point on the previous topic of uh, the resources compared to oil. It really is fundamentally different. You know, there's a lot of comparison of lithium to petroleum and the new dependency on this, but, but lithium is not consumed in these applications. You know, we mine it, we refine it, we put it into inventory in the fleet, and it's there for many, many decades. It's, it's essentially infinitely reusable. It's very different than recycling plastic or, or things like that. Um, we can refine it back to new quality every single time. Cool. Great. I would just say on, on vehicle to, uh, to grid, I think there's an enormous opportunity. Um, we've estimated between $600 to $800 in value that could be returned to a light duty customer. There's even greater potential for banks of uh, school buses or uh, county or municipal fleets, especially if they're on the same substation, they're all parked in the same place. Um, and you don't have the same cycling concerns. If you're doing vehicle to grid, ideally this is once a quarter, twice a quarter. Um, I think there's probably some more concern on vehicle to home if you're running your air conditioner and your uh, washer and dryer off of it constantly every night. But I think vehicle to grid has enormous promise. Great, thank you very much. I yield back to the chair. Thanks, Senator. Uh, we have now Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Really appreciate um, this hearing following on the one that we had last week. Uh, this this reality that we face, um, that we have uh, a, a need, a demand that is just going like this. And uh, we have extraordinary capacity in this country. We know we have the resources. I know that certainly in my home state, we've got the resources. But Mr. Britton, when I walked in, you were talking about the fact that we don't process anything here. We might have the, the minerals, but we also have a 10-year on average permitting process to get a mine online. So we can see this. And if there's any analogies between oil and, and critical minerals, it's in that we saw, we saw the growing vulnerability with oil, just as we're seeing this growing vulnerability with critical minerals. One would like to think that maybe we can just be a little more proactive here in, in how we're going to, to uh, address this in a meaningful way. A uh, couple questions for you first, uh, Mr. Howell. Um, the, the executive order that, uh, that just came out um, indicates five minerals. Um, obviously, there was reason for those five. But in addition to those that were identified in the EO, which minerals do you think that we need to, to add um, because just saying five is not going to get us to where we need to go. So we've got lithium, manganese, nickel, cobalt, graphite. What else needs to come next? Uh, thank you for your question, Senator Murkowski. And it's certainly a, a very important question to understand the, the, the broadness of the critical materials issues for electrification in batteries and, and other areas. So there's other materials that are very important uh, that would we would consider on our watch list, as we mentioned in the 100-day supply chain report for high-capacity batteries back in, in June. Um, that, that would include copper. That would uh, also include, um, uh, you mentioned, you know, graphite, um, manganese, um, nickel, cobalt, lithium, rare earth elements are important as well. And, you know, as we're looking for a, uh, developing a, a robust and resilient supply chain, you know, we, we want, you know, to make sure that aluminum uh, is, a, is an important element as well. Well, I think there's, there's a lot out there. You've indicated that this executive order is the first step in the right direction. But I think we need to appreciate that we need more than step one. Um, so what, what step two may be is, I think, something that we don't want to spend a lot of time just thinking about, but let's actually get moving on it. Um, 
appreciate this discussion about the recycling and, and um, uh, a, a note that it's almost like a national battery reserve that you have with each, each, each vehicle out there. It's, it's, it's intriguing to think about it that way and um, very stimulating as a, to, okay, what can we do with it? But then I've got a, just a, a, a real reality. In my, my state, we're, we are struggling with normal um, recycling, uh, struggling with just trash collection. We send all of our recycled products effectively. We put them on a barge and we barge them down to the Pacific Northwest. That is not efficient. That is not a way to reduce your emissions. So my fear is, is that, is that uh, uh, when we're talking about recycling on a, long, a large scale, we're still a long ways from, from being there. So how we can help facilitate that. I want to ask you, Dr. Wood, um, because you, you were pretty emphatic in saying that we're, we're facing a cliff here. You said it's almost impossible to get there. Um, it's a Herculean task. And we're either going to have to take aggressive steps in what we're doing now to get the minerals out, or we're going to have to push the target. Talk to me a little bit about which you think, well, how, how, what would you advise? Seems to me that we need to, to do a little bit maybe of both. We need to be honest about what our target is, but we definitely need to be producing more. Can you just speak to your self-described cliff here and what we do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, and you know, just a, a quick follow-up on what you said about recycling batteries. We have to recognize that a lot of cars that were sold here in the United States as they come to the end of their life are probably going to be sold onto Mexico and batteries are going to be taken out of vehicles there and they will enter a, a, a different mm -hmm. ecosystem. So as you said, recycling doesn't always stay within the country. Just an important point there. Um, I think that the cliff that we're heading towards is a very, very real one. Um, and you know, to use a phrase that is uh, common here in, in Washington, we need to be clear-eyed about the challenges. And that means that we need to recognize that unless dramatic action is taken today, massive investment into the mining sector, not only are we not going to have the critical minerals that we know we need today, um, we're not going to have those critical minerals that we don't know that we're going to need in the future. So the mining industry. Um, is fundamentally important to the clean, clean energy transition. It's one of the things that too many groups in this country don't understand. What they say is they say, no, mining is dirty. Mining is 19th century. No, mining is the basis of the 21st century clean economy. And that's one thing that we need to emphasize over and over again. Now, is my preference for pushing back those deadlines or those targets? Absolutely not. You know, I'm the father of a 20-month-old of a young girl, a uh, little girl who is, you know, is, is hopefully going to have a bright future uh, in, a, in, a, in a world that is sustainable. I want those targets to be met. But we have to recognize how complicated it is. And it's not enough just to say, well, let's have more recycling. Let's have more tax credits. Let's, we need to approach this in much more of a, of a strategic uh, a way that recognizes that this is about the future of the United States. This is about not just our climate goals, but our geopolitical goals. This is about a global competition that we're currently engaged in with China. The Chinese recognize it much better than we do. Well, I appreciate what you're saying about being clear-eyed. And I also thank you for bringing up the, um, the discussion about the resources under the seabed, the, the National Seabed Authority, and the fact that the United States really isn't at the table in these conversations. I said a letter to the Secretary of Energy in February asking why, why this isn't part of, of the discussion and, and, and shouldn't it be. I think there is a recognition, as you say, that there are enormous resources that are there and others will be accessing them and how they do it and perhaps in a ma way and a manner that is not the best environmental practices. So, if we're not going to do it here, we can't just close our eyes to, to, to extraction in other countries or under the seabed where environmental issues may be um, something that we wish that we'd paid attention to. My, I'm well over my time, but thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Murkowski. Senator Hirono. Oh, what? Oh, I'm, excuse, I, I'm, yes. I apologize. There you uh, go. I apologize to there you, you as well as to Senator Cantwell. Sorry, Senator Cantwell. The uh, 
No, the list that the chairman gave thank me you. correctly points to okay, you. Okay, thank you. I, well, continuing on this theme, and I want to again thank Senator Murkowski for her work when she was chair of this committee on these important issues. She did constantly raise critical minerals, but this theme couldn't be more specific because they're uh, important, obviously, for missile guidance systems, satellites, and microchips. And so here we are in this big discussion about what we're going to do to get a better supply chain on microchips, and we're trying to get this bill right now and get our house, uh, get our colleagues to appoint conferees and get the conference going. But one reason we need them is electric vehicles, which we were just discussing. Um, we've been on this price roller coaster now, uh, but we want drivers to pay three to five times less per mile than conventional vehicles, and we know we can do that. So got to get the Got to get chips, get chips, got to get continuation of the investment in, in critical minerals. And while we have a shortage today, the need is going to double and triple. So we got to get going, and there's no time to wait with these outrageous prices. So I wanted to ask and emphasize, um, to manufacture the number of EVs we need to reach by 2030, um, one projection is that the critical minerals, um, you know, would create this incredible demand. And of course, we just discussed that we don't want it to do demand and support by other countries that we're trying to uh, get off of their uh, agreements. One thing is, I really want to understand from the witnesses, innovation that's necessary to drive down the quantity of critical minerals to produce an EV battery over time. I hear that there is work to be done in this particular area. I, don't, I see Mr. Britton, you nodding your head. Maybe you, sh you could take that, followed by Mr. Howell or Mr. Uh, Strobel. Um, I understand that batteries used in EV have dramatically increased in density over time, and the average cost of lithium-ion batteries has decreased, decreased by almost 90% in the last decade. So what, how do you see the innovation and the material science breakthroughs giving us an economy of scale to bring down the critical mineral price. I'll be quick and turn it over to Mr. Howell, but um, the solid state batteries, um, I think we all have a lot of hope in. There's companies like QuantumScape, um, Sparks, who just announced um, 900 jobs in West Virginia. Um, that is a really important development, um, and it couldn't come soon enough, which uh, is, it, the reason it's important is that one, the charging times um, may accelerate dramatically, but also it doesn't require um, as much, if any, cobalt, and I think that's an important part of the supply chain considerations. Mr. Howell. Thank you, Senator Cantwell, for that important, very, very important question. We have such a, a wide-ranging portfolio of research and development innovations in the pipeline for next-generation battery chemistries um, targeted to reduce the amount of critical minerals that are needed uh, in the future for those batteries and increasing the performance and decreasing cost. So some of the things, such as solid-state batteries, which would enable lithium metal systems uh, which would replace the need for graphite in these batteries, but also coupling that with earth abundant materials on the cathode side, such as lithium sulfur, are, are non um, cobalt, non nickel um, cobalt, uh, cathodes as well. So, innovation is very, very important. Uh, we have a robust RD program poised uh, in, to, to take advantage of our innovation space here in, in, here in the United States, including our national laboratory and university system, but also our innovators in industry as well. So. Thank you. Mr. Strobel, did you want to add something to that? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm actually on the board of directors at QuantumScape, so I uh, see a lot of that company. And, you know, I, I think while a lot of these advanced technologies, you know, have promise, they often have a chance to shift from one critical material to another. So I think we have to be a little cautious there. And, you know, solid state batteries have excellent performance, charge time is noted but they actually use more lithium per, you know, per kilogram of battery or per battery than maybe some others. So you know, we, we also you know, may end up moving the nickel consumption a little bit higher. Um, so these, these definitely are, are exciting, um, but there's a lot of trade-offs and it, it's quite a complex field. Um, I think we need to keep pressure and keep focus on, on how we actually secure enough of these materials. Um, maybe one other point I'd like to highlight is just the that having a manufacturing base of how to refine and convert these critical materials into the battery components gives us flexibility. Right now, if we're buying the manufactured subcomponent from China, for instance, we don't have much flexibility. That determines the 
the performance of the battery. If we're able to source you know, various types of nickel concentrate or lithium concentrate from any one of four or five different mines or countries, we have a lot more security and a lot more flexibility uh, to be able to multi-source and adjust to problems in the field. So you know, I would argue that perhaps investing in that manufacturing base so we can flexibly source is as critical, if not more critical, than increasing the supply of just the raw critical yep. materials. Well, this is one of the reasons why I know we're going to have a big debate when we go to conference on this bill about supply chain issues. And I think some of my colleagues, well, why would you spend any money on supply chain? Well, this is why we would spend money on supply chain, because you have to figure this out. You need, you know, individual companies can do what they're trying to do to isolate themselves, to project like on, on uh, various minerals. But we really need to have a more sophisticated plan than that. So I hope our colleagues will support money and resources for us at the federal level to be more aggressive here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hoven. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Howell, uh, at the uh, University of North Dakota, we have the Energy Environmental Research Center, and they're working with the Department of Energy uh, on a pilot plant project to extract rare earth minerals uh, from our lignite coal. As you know, we have a very robust lignite coal-fired electric industry uh, in uh, North Dakota. And so, uh, you know, uh, I guess I just want your thoughts and input on, um, you know, that whole concept of extracting these rare earth minerals from coal um, and, uh, you know, what you think we can do to uh, make it, uh, to improve it, to make it more feasible, make it more cost effective, commercially viable, all those things. What are the kind of things we can and should be doing to make that happen? Uh, thank you, Senator Hoven, for your question. Um, uh, extracting um, key materials and critical materials from unconventional resources like coal, coal mine tailings, and, and, and coal ash, very important. Uh, concept that we're pursuing, um, not only for rare earth elements, but also for lithium and other battery materials as well. So we're working uh, close with the Fossil Energy Carbon uh, Management Office within the Department of Energy, to develop demonstration programs to understand what the opportunity space is for, um, for, for recovering and, and retrieving uh, critical minerals from, from mine uh, tailings and, and, coal, and coal ash. Uh, mm -hmm. That work, you know, is is ongoing and in, in, in many in cases just getting started. So, not really sure what the opportunity is, but that's the next step is to try to understand first how much rare earth can we extract, and then can we do it affordably and um, in a in a responsible and sustainable m manner. Mr. Forney, I'm going to go down that same track with you, uh, General Atomics, who uh, of course we work with a lot. Uh, in uh, North Dakota and appreciate all that uh, you're doing in so many different areas. Uh, but the uh, same kind of question for you. I see that you're working on a rare earth uh, separation process demonstration plant in Wyoming, which is also a tremendous state in terms of energy production and certainly uh, at the very forefront of utilizing uh, coal. So uh, what, you know, what elements do you hope to extract in that project? And back to the same question, how do we, you know, this is a, this is a priority. This, there's a, you know, we need to have a sense of urgency about getting these rare earth minerals. What do we need to do to make this happen sooner rather than later? Well, th thanks for your question, uh, Senator. Yes, we are uh, busy in Wyoming with the Department of Energy, and the focus on the plan in Upton, Wyoming, is about permanent magnet material. Um, you know, if you look at our resources for missile guidance systems or critical resources required for new submarine electric motors, um, that's a different kind of EV, obviously, than what's being talked to about my, uh, my panelist members here. But we are very, very focused on the permanent magnets today. However, some of that material also is used when we, we have to dope uh, some of our um, crystal for lasers technologies, whether it's in space or in ground or air, doesn't matter. And uh, the, the uh, uh, neodymium is, is critical for that. By the way, that same material is very critical as uh, the medical community uses more and more lasers for diagnosis and treatment. Uh, so that material is going to become abundantly required in the next 10 years, much more than it is today. So we do a tremendous amount on UAS, uh, particularly again in the Grand Forks region. We want to continue to do that. We have partnerships there like none other. Uh, we continue to work to build those. One of the things, you know, obviously China's 
you know, very dominant in that whole small UAS space. And of course, with General Thomas, you're very involved with UAS, you're the leading company in the world in that regard. What can we do, particularly because it requires so much stored energy, how do, how do we do more in that whole realm with the small UAS and, and this whole concept of how we uh, store energy, it obviously goes to batteries, lithium, all that kind of stuff. You know, what are your thoughts there? Uh, thanks again for the uh, stimulating question. Uh, General Atomics actually is working on this problem. Um, I spoke earlier about the fact that we have unavailability of the right batteries that we had been qualifying for our UASs. So we had to actually uh, choose a battery that may not be as good. It doesn't have the same qualities, doesn't have the same characteristics uh, that we had uh, previously selected from Asia, but we did find a battery in North America and we were able to change the battery management system to be able to use that. But secondly, uh, we're not stopping there. As you know, we're a very innovative company, so we're working actually on uh, some of the raw material requirements, such as using silicon carbide for cathode development so that we can increase the amount of energy storage that we get, the capacity of the battery. And we don't stop there. We're also working on fuel cell systems and a combination of fuel cell systems uh, and uh, battery systems. And, and lastly, of course, you know about our legacy uh, on nuclear reactors. So uh, fortunately, there are many um, uh, nuclear activities right now that uh, GA is very involved with, both in space and terrestrially. Yeah, and, and I really appreciate what you're doing. Of course, you on the electromagnetic side, but then combined with the aviation side, it, it, it really is exciting and incredibly important work. So appreciate it very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hirono. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank the panel. So it, it's uh, obvious, if it wasn't obvious before, that there is a huge uh, demand for these critical uh, minerals and, and uh, the, the, the scale of the need is massive. Uh, so I don't know if some of the minerals that, that we need uh, can be uh, uh, met uh, more efficiently uh, through recycling and maybe some of the other minerals we can't do it through recycling very well. So I, I'd like to uh, uh, really focus in on it. So what are maybe three or four steps that we should do because we're so behind the eight ball now. So, for example, is, and I just toss it out to the panel, is uh, uh, updating our 150-year-old mining law. Uh, is that one of the very specific things we can do? We need to modernize. Yes, so I see somebody, I see Mr. Wood, Dr. Wood shaking, saying, yes, what about the rest of you? The mining I'm law, 150 years old, can we, do, okay. And then recycling, I think, uh, Dr. Wood, you said recycling uh, will only um, enable us to get 10%, but that's, you say that is not insig insignificant. So what more should government be doing to encourage recycling uh, to extract some of these critical mi minerals? That would be Mr. Howell, you're with DOE? Yes, yes. Anything specific we can do to encourage recycling? Uh, thank you for that uh, question, Senator Hirano. Uh, certainly a very important question. So in terms of updating our mining laws, uh, that was part of our 100-day supply chain report on high-capacity batteries. That, that was one of the needs and action items for the federal government. Um, and it, it is important in terms of recycling. You know, we've talked a, a lot about recycling electric vehicle batteries, and there's that 15-year gap between a, a new vehicle and when it's really salvaged. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a, a large opportunity in consumer electronic batteries, which uh, almost 100% by weight of that cathode is cobalt, uh, lithium cobalt. So we need to develop a, a, a more of a national recycling plan in order to capture not only electric vehicle batteries, but consumer electric batteries as well. So it, it, I think one of the uh, testimonies I, I uh, went through, we should have a, a whole of government approach to what, what we need to do. So it's not just interior that looks at the mining law. It's not just DOE that figures out how the heck we're gonna meet the needs of, uh, of electric vehicles and all that. So is there a group of uh, people Converging within the administration to There's, properly yeah. address all these issues? Yes. Yes, Senator. Um, uh, I chair the Federal Consortium for Advanced Batteries, which includes 12 federal agencies, and okay. within those federal agencies, almost 50 offices. Um, 
And so we've band together um, uh, over two years now to develop the national blueprint for lithium batteries, which includes a lot of key actions that we can can develop together um, as federal agencies in our no, sort of our normal uh, everyday business to achieve key actions to uh, develop a robust uh, supply chain for batteries from minerals to processing mm -hmm. all the way through battery component production, cell production, and recycling. Some of these then do not require any legislative action. You can do it administratively there, in a some joint of, effort. Some of those, that's, that is correct. Some of the actions that we're pursuing do not require legislative action. It, it, it uh, um, requires a lot of collaboration. For uh -huh. instance, uh, we are developing a strategic plan to, uh, um, to um, uh, partner with uh, allied nations that, that mm -hmm. could possibly help us and partner with us in order to supply critical minerals. And that's led by the Department of State, but, but the other agencies are in support of that in developing the, that, uh, those concepts and those strategies. So has the group that you're talking about issued a report of some sort? The National Blueprint for Lithium Batteries is, and, and also that particular group um, was instrumental in developing the 100-day supply chain report. What about uh, the changes to the 150-year mining laws? Has your group come up with any specific changes that should be considered? Um, we are starting to work with the Bureau of Land Management and the Department of Interior to support that, uh, particularly from our perspective. You know, they have the lead there. Our perspective would be to support through technical analysis and technical assistance as needed. Do you have a sense of urgency about the need to address our need for uh, critical minerals? Yes. So would that, does that mean that as you're looking at the 150-year law, that is there a time frame for you to provide us with some suggested changes? We, we do not. Uh, I would let, um, sort of defer to my colleagues in the Department of Interior first on that. Uh, we do not have a time frame at, 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 at this point. Well, what, what I get is, and I am over my time, but uh, uh, there needs to be a sense of urgency across the board, not just from the administration, but within the, 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 those of you who represent. Did you want to add something? Raise your yeah, hand. if oh, I could maybe briefly, I, I, I think, um, you know, one thing you asked, you know, what, what could we be doing maybe better to help incentivize some of this? Mm -hmm. You know, today, it, it, you know, there's no, you know, restrictions, rules against exporting a lot of these same materials. You know, we're, we're actually readily, frequently exporting all of our devices, critical minerals mm -hmm. back to Asia mm -hmm. in the form of almost garbage. Yes. Uh, at the same time, it's almost impossible to import these materials. We've worked to try and import, you know, consumer electronics batteries mm -hmm. from South and Central America can't do it. It's, it's hazardous waste. It's, you know, unwanted garbage. So, you know, we, we have really asymmetric and incorrect, I'd say, import-export rules around some of these things. You know, at the same time, we're focusing on how do we expedite mining, but we're, we're exporting freely the stuff that we've already mined and not allowing new imports. Well, so what, are you suggesting that we prevent the exportation of these items? I think it might be worth considering how we want to, you know, incentivize keeping the critical materials okay. in the country. So, um, Mr. Howell, I hope your group is taking those kinds of suggestions to, to uh, heart. And one more, if you don't mind. Right ahead, Senator Hirono. Senator, thank you. Um, well, two notes that I think might be helpful in context in the USICA or the America Competes Bill, they actually talk about the importance of preserving um, you know, those end-of-life batteries for recycling so they become that, um, you know, critical mineral stockpile. Uh, so that's important, but also as part of the, the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, there is a, a, this morning I was looking at the critical mineral pieces. There's actually a report. So what you're suggesting is what the bipartisan bill instructed the administration to do to bring together that working group. They're due to report uh, a year upon the date of the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. So your team, I'm sure, will be looking forward to that date. And you, you don't need to take a whole year. <laughs> Speed it up, but make sure that it is something we can rely upon. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Senator Bruno. I want to thank all of the witnesses for being here and for joining us this morning for this very helpful discussion. Members are going to have until the close of business tomorrow to submit additional questions for the record, and the committee stands adjourned.